Good afternoon. I'm joined today by the Deputy Chief Minister, Senator Lyndon Farnham, the Minister for Health and Social Services, Deputy Richard Renniff, and the Deputy Medical Officer of Health, uh, Dr. Ivan Muska. So ministers met last night to discuss the latest advice from STAC and public health and have agreed a phased approach to the de-escalation of our current COVID measures. These reflect the progress we have made as an island, the high vaccination coverage we benefit from, and the lessened severity of the Omicron variant. So I'm going to be asking my colleagues to outline the changes shortly, but first I wanted to briefly reflect on the last two years responding to the COVID pandemic. So it's been 22 months, two weeks and four days since we reported our first case of COVID-19 in Jersey. In the intervening time, we have worked for islanders to safeguard our collective public health. We've worked with businesses to protect jobs and livelihoods. And we have worked with local charities to support vulnerable islanders. The combined effect of rising vaccination coverage and diminished severity of the Omicron variant has meant that our fatality rate has fallen from more than one in 100 in January 2021 to fewer the one in 1,000 now in January 2022. And hopefully on the screen, that's the box to the right that you can see. Together, we have delivered more than 200,000 vaccine doses, conducted close to 1 million PCR tests, and mobilized an unprecedented amount of capital in support of local jobs and businesses. The strong position we now find ourselves in is very much the result of you. And I want to publicly thank every Islander who has been vaccinated. I'm hoping the slide will go back up, but if you look on the graph, but 90% of Islanders, as was the left-hand uh, graph, by the way, 90% um, of Islanders over 18 have had at least one dose. And crucially, 89% of over 50s have now had three doses. And this ensures that those who are vulnerable in our community are as protected as possible. I want to remind Islanders that anyone over the age of 16 is eligible for a booster jab 12 weeks after their second dose. And it couldn't be easier as you're able to walk into the vaccination centre without a booked appointment to get your first, second or booster dose. And please check gov.je just for the opening hours. So it's thanks to your efforts that we can announce, now announce the relaxation of both our mask legislation and working from home guidance. And that we can then also say, stand down the safer travel policy in early February. We are also ceasing mandatory isolation at the end of March, which will be replaced by strong guidance. And we're gonna be asking the health minister to go into more detail on this shortly. These changes are only possible thanks to the progress we have seen, and they are in line with the medical advice we have received. We must not be complacent. The pandemic is not over, but we are looking at a new stage in our response, one where fixed and enforceable measures can be phased out, and where we can instead rely on the protection afforded by the vaccine, the enhanced precautions which are now second nature to us, and the common sense of islanders. So I'm now going to hand over to the Deputy Chief Minister, who will explain the standing down of our safer travel, po safer travel policy and the relaxation of working from home guidance. Lyndon. Thank you, um, Chief Minister. I'm very pleased that we can announce that from midnight on Monday, the legal requirement for wearing masks will be removed, as will the guidance to work from home. Government-led contact tracing in the community, businesses and schools will end on the 7th of February. Ministers have also made the decision to suspend the safer travel policy from Monday, the 7th of February. This change will mean that all people arriving in Jersey will no longer need to fill out a pre-departure form or be tested on arrival. And travel to 
till Jersey will return to pre-pandemic arrangements. Removing our border testing will make it easier for families to visit and see loved ones, for students to return home, for visitors to once again travel freely and for friends to reconnect. Our pioneering safer travel policy received international recognition and I would like to thank every member of the team who have worked so hard to design, to manage and operate our border policies and of course to the travellers whose patience and understanding have added to its success. The announcements we are making today are in line with the very latest advice from our scientific and technical advisors and our public health officials and reflect the much lower levels of risk now posed to our community. I know that these relaxations have been long anticipated and I am sure they will be welcomed by, the, by, by many as we move towards the end of the pandemic. Businesses and islanders from all sectors of the economy have worked incredibly hard to accommodate the mitigations introduced as our response to COVID-19. And I would like to pay tribute to all those who have risen to the challenge, to all of the businesses who have demonstrated their resolve and adaptability, which has enabled the vast majority of jobs to be protected throughout the pandemic. And I remain confident that we can continue to rebuild our economy with a real purpose. So thank you all. And I will now hand over to the Health Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Lyndon. As the Chief Minister has set out, we're only in this strong position because of the high uptake of vaccination. All islanders who have been vaccinated have played a significant part in restoring these freedoms for our island. It's important to remember that COVID-19 has not gone away. We are not at the end of the pandemic, but here in Jersey, we are at a good stage to change how the virus is managed. On Monday, 7th February, the government-led contact tracing will cease. This will be replaced by guidance asking islanders who test positive to notify those they have been in contact with and to advise their direct contacts to start 10 days of lateral flow testing. This new guidance aligns with our shift towards enabling islanders to manage their own health and will speed up the notification of direct contacts. On Thursday 31st of March, the mandatory isolation requirement for islanders who test positive will also end. This too will be replaced by public health guidance and detailed guidance will be published in due course. But until the 31st of March, I would like to stress that the legal requirement to isolate after a positive test will remain in place with the guidance on leaving isolation remaining unchanged. It's important that islanders continue to isolate if they receive a positive test result. I do understand that some islanders might be concerned about the plans for de-escalation, particularly those who are elderly, vulnerable or at risk. And I would like to reassure islanders that the risk of disease and severe illness in Jersey is now much less than we have known previously. Additionally, in the coming weeks, we will be rolling out the use of molnupiravir, which is an antiviral drug designed to treat COVID during the onset of symptoms. And that will ensure that our most vulnerable islanders are able to access and receive treatment for COVID-19 if they require it. Our management of positive cases is largely dependent on islanders regularly testing themselves with lateral flow tests. It is important that all islanders continue to test themselves and their family members at home. From the 7th of February, the guidance to report a negative LFT result will cease, except where that is necessary to release early from isolation. From this time, it's vital that if you receive a positive lateral flow test, you isolate, 
book a PCR test and inform your direct contacts if your PCR test result is positive. Lateral flow tests are really a brilliant tool in identifying positive cases, particularly in those who are asymptomatic. All islanders can sign up to the home testing program on covidsafe.gov.je to receive a free kit of lateral flow tests. If you're already registered, you're now able to order another kit through a new reordering portal, which can also be accessed through covidsafe.gov.je. So I strongly encourage any islanders who are not already registered to that program to sign up today, as this, alongside with vaccination, will help maintain the position we are at now. I'll now hand back to the Chief Minister. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. I hope the relaxation in our COVID measures announced today will be welcome news to Islanders. We cannot be complacent, but we are in a good place. More than any other single measure, vaccination has been the key to getting us to this point. And we can only keep moving towards normality because of the protection afforded by vaccination. So if you or someone you know hasn't been vaccinated, please know that there is still time. Getting vaccinated is the most important thing you can do to keep yourself and your loved ones safe. Aside from having all the vaccine doses you are eligible for, there are practical everyday steps we are all familiar with that can keep us safe. We would strongly encourage the regular use of LFTs. Whether you're hosting a party, visiting an elderly relative or getting back to the office, make sure you use one of our free lateral flow testing kits to give you and those around you peace of mind. The relaxation of measures we've announced today represents a significant step to normality. But we must remain vigilant and we cannot become complacent, but we can begin to look beyond the pandemic as we learn to live with COVID. Now, hopefully, this will be one of our last press conferences solely dedicated to COVID. And when I was first elected by the Assembly as Chief Minister in June 2018, COVID was not even a cloud on the horizon. We came in to achieve change and with a long-term perspective to set foundations upon which to build an organisation that was fit for purpose for the 21st century and would fulfil the expectations of Islanders. So let's be clear, COVID has dominated our time and has caused delays in other pieces of work, but we've also had some successes. So today I want to thank my fellow Ministers and all the dedicated officers who've worked so tirelessly over the last two years as we have responded to the threat of COVID. But I also want to express my gratitude to those who've been working equally hard on the everyday projects which fall outside our pandemic response. These staff too, and politicians, have had to deal with the impact of COVID and have worked diligently, despite attention often being, often being diverted to each twist and turn of the pandemic. I want to make sure that they receive the recognition they deserve, which is why from Monday we will be beginning a six-week campaign to highlight the important achievements across government over the last four years, emphasising some of those projects which has not, have not received the attention they deserve because of the pandemic, and I hope you will find it informative. Without further ado, thank you for listening, and we'll now take questions from the media. Over to you guys. So, we have from ITV, Alex. From Bailiwick, I will do. I say, Alex, you come up. From Bailiwick, we have Julian. From BBC, we have Amar. Amar. Uh, from 103, we have Harry online. And from the JP, we have Tom, who is where? Oh, he's online as well, is he? Right, sorry, couldn't see him there. Okay, so we'll go in that order. How much of an increase do you expect in cases over the coming months because of the lifting of these restrictions? I think that's one thing we haven't gone into in terms of projections, and don't forget we've also said, um, uh, and to an extent it's also steered our response over the last uh, increase we've had through Omicron, as you know we went up to 4,000. Um, 
is the focus still remains very much, or, sorry, less so on case numbers, but very much more so on what's happening within the health service and hospitalizations. And, and obviously those numbers have come back down, uh, and therefore that's why we're in, in the position we think today, particularly though, bear in mind the focus we've said uh, of that, I don't know if we can bring that slide back up again, just briefly. just to test the team quickly and their reactions. But if you look at that slide and the right-hand bit, which is saying, and if I also, only because my eyesight doesn't quite reach that far. Um, uh, I think it's, you know, last year, uh, to, uh, in the winter 2020 to 2021, of 2,900 cases, I think it is, we had 37 deaths. So that's about 1.3%. Um, whereas this year, we've had 19,500 cases, sorry, this winter and we've had uh, 21 deaths. And so as a percentage, uh, at 0.1%, that means overall the risk is significantly less, even though the number of cases are going up. And that, when that was put to us, I think was quite a compelling statement. And that is basically indicating that the whole risk profile is, taking, is changing. Part of that is the fact, which is the left-hand graph, of the vaccination levels. And therefore, um, as I said, that's why we're moving the focus away from, in most areas, away from numbers of cases to hospitalization and managing that side. Obviously, if we, as we said, there will be measures that remain in education and health. I don't know if anybody wants to add. Is that sufficient for your... Uh, My first one, yes. Perhaps? And um, what's your advice to businesses while making their own policies? Well, I think individual businesses um, will have to make their own decisions. We know, uh, for example, in the transport sphere, there will be one that is uh, likely, I think, to say, well, actually, as a matter of policy, we're going to keep masks in place. And that is very much for them to judge around the, um, the view in terms of uh, what they want to do towards their staff and things like that um, versus, uh, you know, as we've said, in terms of the data, that the risk is now a lot lower. I don't know if Lyndon or Ivan or anybody wants to add to that. Um, I, I think, um, I, mean, I mean, for example, when we're talking about uh, border um, a policy, uh, all of the carriers, I think, are planning to retain as a condition of travel the compulsory wearing of, of masks. And as Chief Minister said, it will be very much up to, to businesses, especially those perhaps involved in carrying uh, public transport carriers. And so I expect we will see some conditions Im imposed upon uh, travellers by those businesses, but otherwise we're leaving it to, um, to, to businesses and customers to, to work closely and sensibly. And finally, you've said a lot of thank yous today. Would you consider thanking Islanders in action by another round of the Spend Local cards? Um, I would love to, but the, um, uh, unfortunately that's when we have to uh, do quite a major arm wrestle with, uh, with Treasury. Um, and uh, so with a more serious face on, I think the, uh, the point of the Spend Local card, which was a huge success, and, um, and I will still uh, thank the team, but I will also say, uh, you know, we will take quite a lot of credit for that one as well. Um, it was the right thing to do at that point in time. The view to date is that uh, that level of fiscal stimulus uh, is not required. Now, if that was to change, or if the advice was to change, uh, we'd be delighted to do it. But obviously, um, one of the moves from the Assembly was that the, the pool of money we had for fiscal stimulus has been capped. Uh, and actually, the, the, the amount uh, that was left has been actually put back into the normal reserve. So it would need, mean it would be a, a, a state's debate and all that sort of stuff. So you couldn't enact it as quickly as we might like. Uh, we have put a lot of uh, support and continue to have uh, a, a certain measure of support uh, for particularly hospitality that will carry on uh, for, uh, I think it's another couple of months. But, um, but no, I think in terms of the spend local card, um, at this stage, there are no plans to do a second run. I will just continue. I will say, we've, we've said it was a global first. Uh, it was part of the kind of innovative approach that we took in dealing with the pandemic. But actually, I do wonder if there are, having demonstrated the ability to have an easy way of getting payments to all islanders, whether there is something there that actually we can then learn from and build it into systems uh, going forward for, for other types of payments that we put out to islanders. But I'll leave that as a thought. Okay, Julian. Thank you, Chief Minister. Um, we know from the, the 31st of March that 
positive cases will not have to isolate, including symptomatic cases. Um, there'll be no checks at the border, um, and there'll be no formal contact tracing. Um, there's still strict rules applying in other countries, and we appear to be moving quite quickly. I'm just wondering, is there a danger that you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and we are moving too soon? No, we've, we've thought through that, and I'll hand over to, I think, whoever wants to go first, but perhaps Ivan and then Richard, or the other way around, uh, followed by Linda at the end. Um, we do think it's proportionate and it's based on the advice. And I go back to that, 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 that slide we had up um, at the beginning. The fact that you are going down to a, a less than 0.1% a, a risk at the moment, that's based on the evidence specific to Jersey, because of the high level of vaccination, is quite compelling from the perspective, in fact, more than quite, very, very compelling, as, and is demonstrating and saying, actually, can you continue to justify the measures that you've got in place, that actually we are now, for Jersey, coming into a more normal position. Obviously, we've got to keep an eye ahead. You know, if there is something that comes out from left field, from another country, uh, in another part of the world, that we then have to respond to, well, we'll, we'll we will do that, and we're making sure that part of the the kind of forward planning is, is making sure that we can continue to respond quickly if we need to. But I think in overall proportionality, it is the right thing to do. I think I'll go to perhaps Richard, Lyndon, Ivan, Ivan in that order. Uh, enforcing isolation for a disease which now carries far less risk is, uh, is not right. It comes to a stage where government needs to step back and we should ask people to manage their own health uh, and the normal considerations apply to any other disease they have. They, they should not spread it. They should look after their family, consider their own health needs. And it's not necessary uh, when it comes to that stage for governments to intervene any longer. Thank you. Lynn, you want to? Just, just briefly, throughout the um, pandemic, we've always put the health of people before um, the, the economy. So, uh, and as a result of that, we've supported the economy. And as I said in my opening speech, businesses and islanders have responded positively and we've managed to protect jobs right through the whole pandemic. When the risks are significantly reduced, you have to weigh up that risk with the potential damage and to our economic well-being if we don't start to move forward. I'm very pleased we're making these um, steps today. We're doing it on the back of the very best advice and, and I believe it will help the island not just back to ep economic well-being but also help islanders to get quickly back to normality. Ivan, do you want to? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> throughout the, the pandemic, we have always acted on balance of risks. Uh, and now we know that the risk from COVID has decreased significantly as a result of vaccination, as a result of the virulence of Omicron, as a result of the development of immunity across uh, a swathe of the population uh, because of uh, coincident past infection. Um, so we're starting to approach uh, what is what are normal type of infections here. Uh, the mortality from influenza uh, normally is of the order of one in a thousand, and the current mortality from COVID, as demonstrated by the chief minister, is one in a thousand. So we are starting to approach that sort of climate with COVID, and it therefore behoves us to balance our mitigation accordingly. And this is what we're doing. We're s s going down, de-escalating in a stepwise, cautious manner, keeping a very close eye on activity. Uh, and we hope to continue to be able to de-escalate as we go forward. But uh, of course, in order to do that, we do need to emphasize the huge importance of people continuing with the vaccination program so that we do not lose traction now that we've gained so much. If I could direct my next question in relation to that, Dr. Muscat, um, fully vaccinated used to be two jabs, now it's three. Um, please paint a picture of the future. Will it be four, five, six? Will we need to get a booster every year, every six months? And what's the future of the vaccination centre at Fort Regent? Uh, how long do you envisage that process going? So I think uh, we still need to determine, by we, I mean uh, larger authorities like JCVI, uh, the uh, uh, European agencies and so forth, need to determine 
based on their study of waning immunity, change in variants, and so forth, what boosters we need going forward. Certainly, uh, we already have experienced and continue to experience the importance of having an annual influenza vaccine. And it may very well be that uh, uh, COVID uh, will require something like that going forward. And it may very well be that, therefore, the vaccine will be a combined vaccine with influenza, for example. Um, and people are already talking about that and actually trialing that type of approach. Um, so that may very well be the future, but I can't give you any more detail than that because there isn't any more detail than that to, 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 to uh, share. Um, again, uh, as we were saying before, we are moving to a more normal type of relationship with this virus. By normal, I mean similar to the relationship we have with other viruses. Uh, and it therefore means that the uh, emergency type response that we've had, part of which is the centralization of a mass vaccination center, uh, will eventually uh, uh, be um, desorbed back to the, uh, peripheral sites. Um, and that will also depend on the provision of vaccines which are more suitable for uh, vaccination through smaller uh, centers uh, using normal cold chain uh, uh, re requirements or smaller package sizes compared with the mass si packages that we currently receive. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Minister. We have obviously seen over the last week or so, a couple of weeks, the number of infections in schools is increasing a lot. Now, obviously, with the work from home recommendation ending on Tuesday, is there a danger that those cases in schools in a largely unvaccinated environment could then spread more easily into workplaces and the community? Well, I think um, we recognise that schools particularly are uh, a, a special area. Uh, and that's why the measures in schools are, broadly speaking, staying the same. So we are recognising the fact that um, we do want to keep measures in place in, in that particular context. Um, I think, ultimately, we then go back to the point, uh, which I made earlier, earlier um, to Alex, um, that we've got to move away from the focus on sheer numbers and, then, and, and focus, really, on making sure that the health service can cope and, uh, and the, the overall basically fatality risk to islanders, uh, which is this point about going back to, uh, as far as we can, back to normal. Uh, the evidence to date uh, is very, very, very compelling. And that is basically saying, as I, Ivan just said, uh, in essence, the level of risk is, is getting down to being comparable to that of flu. And therefore, um, that's really how we are responding accordingly. I don't what know if anybody else wants to add to that on the education front, but... No, OK, sorry. Uh, what would you say to vulnerable islanders who, you know, after today's announcement, might feel more cautious about going into public places when people aren't wearing masks or when isolation policies are eased? There will be people who might have a degree of, of anxiety who are vulnerable to this virus. Will you be sort of giving any particular advice or recommendations to those people who, who are more vulnerable? I'll do a high level on that, and then I will point to Ivan and Richard, I think, because I've said that very much in the area. My understanding that for particularly vulnerable uh, islanders, they already have advice and guidance that they've had in the past. Uh, but I think the fundamental one, uh, as I've understood it, is that, um, uh, that most people, and by that I mean significantly uh, majority of the of islanders are capable of receiving the vaccine uh, and therefore the fact that we've got 88 percent of islanders over the age of 50 which is regarded from an age perspective as the as the vulnerable categories there will be others in different age brackets um, have got their triple vaccine that has made a significant difference in the impact vaccine is having as far as the impact the omicron is having on islanders and on fatalities uh, and um, but recognizing concerns, uh, I think the, the one thing I certainly would say is that um, if an islander still wants to wear a mask, 
that is absolutely fine. I'm, I may well wear a, wear a mask in certain, in, in certain places. I don't know yet. Um, in terms of um, if they want to give, uh, keep, you know, keep distance, then actually it's, again, for islanders to apply common sense. If somebody's wearing a mask and is obviously uh, distancing themselves from other people, please give them space. It's going back to that kind of common sense approach, which is where we were uh, at various times during the course of the last year. Um, so recognising those concerns, uh, equally, we do also um, have to try and get back to a, 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 to a normal position, particularly based on the scientific evidence. So it's basically going back to that main message of individuals taking the decisions that are right for themselves, that they are comfortable with. And don't forget, we are still very strongly recommending, for example, the use of LFTs, the lateral flow tests, and, and very much keep doing those um, uh, uh, you know, from now onward. Uh, Richard or Ivan, do you want to comment on, on particularly on, on vulnerable islanders? Well, we will be revising guidance to very specific groups of people with certain conditions or people whose immune system is, is suppressed. Uh, but for those who may feel nervous, I'd just like to offer reassurance that really the situation the island is now in is far, far better than it has been. Uh, and if people still wish to exercise caution, that's, that's what we're saying, and we're asking everyone to, to do that because the pandemic is not over. But if people have particular fears about being in crowded spaces, please try and avoid those. Uh, or if they're living with family, they can make sure that their family or guests they receive are taking or doing their LFT tests and getting negative results before they, they meet up. Uh, so sensible measures can still protect us all. Thank you. And finally, we know, you know, this is a, the virus has proven itself to be very unpredictable. Mm. We've seen variants emerge. Currently, Omicron is quite mild. If a more dangerous variant were to emerge, how quickly would you be able to bring back departments that will be winding down, like contact tracing? That's one of the um, crucial questions we've been asking. So, um, very clearly, uh, the whole one of the purposes of what we're calling the uh, uh, well, the, ne the next strategy that's going to be coming through, which, if you like, is the post-pandemic, uh, I think, preparation. Uh, that will uh, also identify the kind of measures that um, you know we we would be prepared to take if we need to. We have demonstrated all the way through an ability, I think, to move quite swiftly. We have learnt a lot, and obviously, as the data changes, and as you can look back and say, well. Was this measure effective and was this measure not? Depending what the scientific evidence you're getting, if there is another uh, variant that comes out from their field somewhere, um, you know we will respond accordingly, and um, and we will obviously keep systems available that if they do need to be turned up, they will be. Uh, do you want to add, uh, perhaps uh, either Richard or Adam? All I can uh, say is that we, uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, we had not really made any uh, detailed plans about how to set up contact tracing and testing and so forth, but we did set them up at quite a fast pace uh, in keeping with uh, the, the, the equipment and, and so forth that was available to us. Uh, so we have learned from that and we, as uh, the Chief Minister has just said, we are acutely aware of the need uh, for us to potentially be able to reactivate those things and therefore uh, we, we, we will not keep them, uh, 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 we will not dismantle them and uh, uh, access to them uh, completely. Uh, we, we are mindful of the fact that they need to be reactivated if necessary. Thank you. Okay, thanks. thanks guys. Okay, Harry. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, all. Um, I'm just going back to, to schools. Um, it's previously been mentioned that a, a lot of uh, cases in schools at the moment, I think probably about half of all cases are in ed education settings, a big jump in the last um, couple of weeks. Obviously, students have to go out for testing, and that's disruptive for um, a lot of them. Um, what's being done, can, what can be done quickly to, to limit that effect? I'm um, thinking air filtration devices across all schools, for example, and, and also with schools, a lot of parents who want to go in for you know, parent-teacher meetings, they want their contact to go into schools to see their children's work. Um, how quickly can that, can that happen again? Because when you, they, 
when the rest of the island's going back to normal, you want the same in school, surely, as quickly as possible. I think we've got to recognise, and we've we've been quite clear so far, that um, that schools are a, are a special area for all the reasons we've talked about, and the focus always remains on trying to minimise the educational disruption. Uh, to date, we have been very good at that, but obviously, again, Omicron rep in that particular represents a challenge. Bear in mind that, uh, depending on the age ranges, that's where a lot of unvaccinated uh, people remain. Um, so in terms of your second part, I can't particularly answer that question in terms of how quickly uh, you know, the, the measures, et cetera, you talk about uh, will, will, will go back in place if they're not there already. But the, um, the first part, um, apologies, which I've just lost my flow of the frame. Uh, your first point on that was? Uh, air filtration devices? Yes, that's the one, sorry. Um, is that they are on basically in the process of being ordered, uh, sorry, extra ones are being ordered, and their intention is that they will be in play uh, uh, as soon as we can. Uh, within days? Um, I don't know what the supply chain is, but I've understood. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming sort of... Uh, I won't give a time frame because I'll always be held hostage on it, but a short time frame is what's envisaged. So uh, it was brought to CAM yesterday. This was about additional uh, air filtration uh, filtering systems, and uh, and we gave the go-ahead, And uh, as I understand it. Um, uh, I think we've got 100 air, filter air filtration units being ordered today. I think we're expecting let's say 10 days, but um, obviously that's all dependent on delivery time, uh, actual um, logistics and getting them in, that's the expectation. Are you hopeful in terms of parents coming in this academic year? You don't want to drag on into September, given the other restrictions by the end of March, everything else will be as normal as it can be. Well, I think we, want to, we all want to get everything as normal as possible, but uh, we've got to allow uh, education system just to settle down in terms of uh, get past the, the hump they're going through um, uh, in terms of um, uh, of the increase in cases, and we've always said we've leave it with obviously the education minister and particularly individual heads to make the decisions they wish to make. Okay, thank you. And um, can I just ask for a separate separate question? Um, previously, been talked about the uh, restrictions about um, mandatory isolation ending at the end of March. Um, how do you ensure compliance with people staying home over the next uh, couple of months or so? I mean, there'll be people who could think, um, oh, I've got a mould, you know, I've got COVID, but it's very mild. In a bit, I won't have to isolate. Now I do. Why do I need to? How do you ensure that continued compliance in the short term? Uh, the teams remain in place is the short answer. Um, and uh, and we'll be carrying out their normal compliance routines. Uh, I don't know if um, Richard or I haven't got anything extra to uh, add to that, but that's certainly my um, expectation uh, and our understanding. Well, yes, I confirm the team will remain in place. The team does check on people uh, and it does enforce isolation or does, does report up uh, cases that we know where isolation requirements are, are not being met. Okay. Right. Thanks, Harry. Tom. Uh, good afternoon. Um, th thank you, Chief Minister. Um, my um, list of questions has been gradually ticked off <laughs> by my journalistic colleagues, as has my list of reserve questions, and um, <laughs> uh, so I don't feel the need to detain you and viewers longer. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. I'm lost for words, but thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, well, on that basis, I think we'll draw things to a close. I do believe there are, uh, we'll draw it to a close because I think um, individual interviews are required or wanted if I are getting nods from various quarters here. So as we conclude our press conference today, I do want to thank the members of the media for their questions and also uh, to all of you for watching. This is not the end of the pand pandemic, but we do believe it marks the end of our emergency period. So as we announce these relaxations today, we must all be vigilant and continue to act responsibly. Whether it's taking a lateral flow before gathering with friends, choosing to go for a walk outside instead of gathering inside, or above all, getting vaccinated, we can all take practical steps to reduce our risk, to keep each other safe, and to help our community. Thank you very much for listening. 
and I wish you all a safe and pleasant weekend. And we'll draw this to a close.